Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, and this is the final episode of my Bayonetta Let's Play. So, are you ready to see where the uh, insanity curve tops out? Because, um, this game is bonkers. So, let's go. To be honest, this isn't really an epilogue, it's just that for some reason they decided to call the final chapter an epilogue. Uh, this game has an epilogue. And that is what I would recall the that was that is what I would call the cutscenes after the end of the game. Oh dear, looks like we failed. The world's gonna end. What a shame, nothing we can do. Now I really don't see what purpose that serves, mechanically speaking. I don't know much about rocketry, but I've played a lot of Kerbal Space Program. Why would you need an air brake on a rocket ship? The answer, naturally, is that aesthetics are more important than function. Thank God. There's still time. Which arguably is the main theme of this game. Ready for some cool motorcycle stunts? The left eye, our treasured left eye, will never fall into the hands of another. It is the pride of the Umbra witches. I actually think this game's interesting thematically because it doesn't so much say things as it is just kind of. Um, a collection of really, really rad stuff. It would be really easy to make the argument that it is entirely uh, uh, form without substance, but I think it is actually making an intentional, like, aesthetic argument in favour of uh, form and aesthetic and things being rad and cool. And uh, on that basis, I think that it actually does have a valid thematic point in and of itself. Um, rather than simply being only superficial. It has a depth, it's just that its depth revolves around superficiality. Which might be giving it too much credit, but um, if this is my let's play and I will give things credit that they don't deserve if I want to. So yeah, we are currently driving a motorcycle up the side of a rocket ship into space to fight God. Um, that's... and yeah, no, the absurdity curve still has further to go, actually. I really love the design. Am I going to crash into every single one of these? But I love the design of this whole weird rocket ship. You do, you do kind of think that this is maybe the rocket ship that would let you fight God, as divine energy spills out of the end of it. Here, as these tangled, coiled bodies fall apart, uh, it would be very easy to spin some kind of artsy bullshit about what that might mean thematically, but genuinely I think it just is there to look cool. And that itself has a thematic purpose, as we've established. Nah, Jean. You've provided me with many blessings. The one and only authentic left eye. Merely seeing it must stir jealousy within you. Your body must yearn to feel a new universe form around it. Is that what they call it now? I have no intentions of gazing upon the left eye. I am here to reclaim my Umbran sister. <laughs> he disapproves. Is that the moon? Did he explode the moon? We, we need that. We need that for stuff. I've always been curious about the like tendency for bosses in video games or whatever to um you know throw blow up the moon and then have the moon rocks hit you 
if you're if that thing could smash the moon, it wouldn't it be more efficient just to smash me with it directly? Maybe he doesn't want to damage his rocket ship. Um, for that matter, why does it need to be in space? There's a lot of questions I have that I don't expect to get answers to. Um, and to be honest, in most things, I would say, oh, like this is an aesthetic. Um, exa Oh fuck! God damn it! The time has come for Jubileus to return. At last, the trinity of realities will know their real ruler, and time will begin anew. Theresa, <sighs> wake up! Are you insane? Light and dark. Unless both eyes remain, the universe will lose its balance and face another Armageddon. Then this thing should have slept for eternity. Now you must wake up, Cereza. Cereza! Cereza! Damn you! Open your eyes! Sean. Cereza! You aren't the person I sealed away 500 years ago. You have the strength to overcome this and fight. Finish this. That he doesn't even try to escape, he just kind of accepts it. So today we meet God, and God is pretty. So, uh, yeah. My impassioned cry of oh fuck was because I realised I had in fact forgotten to backtrack and therefore missed the final uh, bonus combat challenge in the game. Oh well. Rest, my friend. I'm off to get that black cat. So I actually think that um, putting the final one there was a big mistake. So I uh, like that's why I've not decided to like go back and re-record this or whatever. Because this game's like sense of momentum is really important to it, and these final few chapters absolutely kind of um, they really go ham. They just um, they charge and accelerate. I played through the final like five chapters of this game in a row just because the sense of escalation was there um, in one evening. <laughs> so um, given that, I think that choosing to backtrack in a sequence that is both thematically and physically um, extremely aggressively forwards moving. Um, you're literally accelerating into... Um, so I actually have a lot of heavy criticisms of this boss fight mechanically, however, um, I want to try and finish what I'm saying first. So put it simply, um, a rocket ship is an extremely linear envi environment. That thematically reflects what you're supposed to be feeling in this instance, which is an intense forwards drive to go rescue your your character, to go rescue Jean's long lost love Bayonetta. So these two things tie together so perfectly well that it is very strange to me that they would expect you to stop at the top of the rocket ship, turn around and run all the way back down again to go do a bonus fight challenge. Um, 
it's very out of character with what, um, you know, with what the character should be doing in that instant, which is continuing to drive forwards for justice. Um, so, yeah, that's why uh, I'm not going back to show you that one. I will just skip it. Uh, it's also not especially interesting. It's of a type we've seen before. It's there's no really really new components. Um, so yeah, uh, moving on to this actual boss itself. This boss fight has about five or six, maybe seven phases. Um, the objective is ultimately to smash all of these tentacle, hair, feather, tail thingies. I think she has seven or eight of them. I guess logically if she has seven phases there would be seven tails. But um, yeah, um, in terms of what you would actually... In terms of the ideas in it, I don't think there's much of a problem. However, in terms of the forms they've chosen to push these ideas through, uh, I think this is a badly designed boss fight. Um, in these sequences where you're running around on the inside of this... Uh, like, these phases where you're running across um, surfaces themed around the various elements, I'm fine with. I think that's a fun medium phase for this. Uh, there's a lot of different attacks to learn, but hey, it's the final boss, why not? Um, however, in the phases where you are running around on the inside of the sphere while she hovers over you and you've got to do stuff, that's where it starts to have problems, because first off, the camera is very uncooperative. It's quite hard to see what you're doing, and you're constantly hit by things that are coming from off the edge of the screen, which you can't possibly see. Um, it's, and it's not like there's audio cues for you to um, predict, uh, to let you predict your dodge timings. Um, so essentially you're hit by things you can't see, which cancel what you're trying to do, and that is bad design, because it feels bad and it's not a meaningful challenge. So, um, that follows th through into the same uh, phase that we'll see in a minute, which is um, after this elemental phase. Also, I assume that each of the different uh, tentacles has a different element associated with it. Because we go through all of the classical elements here. Earth, fire, water, air, rockets, lasers, uh, black holes later. You know, just all of the classical European elements. Um, it is nice to see this uh, zooming jump mechanic showing back up again, but as may or may not happen in a minute, um, all of the same criticisms I had of it previously will apply again. Um, well, if I'm unlucky and it decides to be uncooperative. As you can see, it's not always... Uh, yeah, so... When I was doing my practice run of this, I found that very often I would be... Um, in the position with the jump icon visible on the screen, and instead of letting me jump, it would in fact... Uh, just she would just jump on the spot even though the jump icon was there uh, so again this is this is thematically all about momentum and speed and um, charging forwards without with, with no heed or respect to uh, anything that gets in your way and so these awkward moments where you just kind of you press the button and nothing happens and you jump and wiggle around in a little circle it brings you out of the moment. It um, There's a good word for it, but I can't remember it right now because I have memory problems that means sometimes I can't remember what words are. Much to the infuriation of certain people in my life um, who hear me asking for things in very strange and arcane ways rather than just saying, hey, can you pass me that object? Anyway, um, I was saying something before I got distracted and started talking about objects. But I don't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, this game is entirely about motion. So, as I said before in uh, the previous boss fights that had this problem, it brings you out of the moment. It, um, what is, there's a, there's a word that's like investment or something referring to, oh, there it is, the classical laser of elements. Classical element of lasers? Yeah. Um, by the way, I really like the sort of infinite universe visible through the cracks in her exterior shell. 
I think that's cool. Um, so this fight, this, the portions of this fight that are conducted looking up from below, I think are again a bad design component because... Oh fuck. Oh god, no, 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 no. Oh fucking hell, that was close. So that is an insta-kill attack. Uh, I hate insta-kill attacks. I think they are bad design. Um, I can't stand them, honestly. Um, I've never seen a game that used insta-kill attacks well. Um, or if I have, it was an, uh, an unusual example. Um, so yeah. As I've said, it's very hard in these segments when the camera is looking up from the bottom or swinging around from the sides on this orb to see where attacks are coming from or what those attacks are. So basically you just have to... Um, whenever she's up above you and starts to do some kind of a, a charged up punching attack, immediately start running away as fast as possible. Because if you get sucked into that uh, deadly center of that black hole attack, that is it. Um, it doesn't send you back to the bo beginning of the boss fight, however it does do something in fear- oh. Okay, I did actually hit that button and it did not register, so, uh, that's not great. What's this? Okay, this is not as bad as the black hole attack, but if it hits you, uh, it's actually very amusing. It turns you into Cereza, which, um, is one of the only kind of, like, mighty god of space and time, um, attacks that this en enemy actually has that feels like the kind of thing a god might do if it, if you made it angry. Um, the vast majority, like, this is supposed to be, you know, the creator of the universe. Even if they're lying about that, they do seem to genuinely think that this thing has the ability to rewrite the entire universe and create a universe much more to their liking. If it has that amount of power, why is it punching me? If it can just turn me into a child whenever it likes, or throw me into a black hole to death, why is any of this a problem? Um, I don't quite understand why, if I can punch God, God should care. And it's not just that Bayonetta is that powerful or whatever, because... Uh, because I got turned into a child. Well, you haven't seen that happen. I'll tell you what, I'll let it happen now, just so you can... Yep, see? You get turned into tiny baby Cereza, and then you have to dodge punches. Um, I let that happen intentionally so you could see this, because it's dumb. Um, the first two punches always miss. The third punch, you can just about dodge if you time it right, but it's honestly more likely that you will... Oh, interesting. I've never gotten dodge timing off of that before. I think it was that uh, rocket ship, actually. So, I've forgotten what I was saying again. Anyway... <laughs> Um, with a bit of luck, I will get another another chance to kill her in a second. So, it's irritating that they turn you into, into baby Cereza, but um, there's actually a really easy dodge to them, which is that if you go into bird form, and as you can see, that's how you get the dodge on it, um, you ha because uh, you essentially remain in its hitbox for a second, after you turn back into Bayonetta, and because that's the case, if you time it right, you can hit the turn into bats instead of getting hurt button. But yeah, um, this game has kind of a scale issue in that if hell is powerful enough just to eat god anyway, why is any of this a problem? Because Ordinarily, I would say, oh, the specific conceptual details of how these things work is irrelevant. This is an aesthetic exercise, or the specific mechanical details, the, logis the logistics of all of this stuff. It's irrelevant. It, you know, that kind of thing. There is a deeper meaning that is being explored, so don't think about that, think about the deeper meaning. However, um... Bayonetta is so much about the extremity of its nonsense that um, you're supposed to care about these things and so if they aren't, if they don't make sense, it brings you out of the moment, in my opinion, and I think that's detrimental to it um, as a work of art. So uh, that's my opinion about that.
if I do hit any of these planets, it arrests Jubileus' motion enough, and then that's instantaneous game over. Because I guess that's the point God decides to get serious about killing you. Um, oh, that was a tight one. So, yeah. Um, I'm not sure why being smashed into a planet is a, is not a problem for this for this deity, but being punched into the sun is a problem. I don't understand why hell is powerful enough to defeat heaven. If it do, like, why don't they just do that then? Um, and instead of the logic not being relevant and therefore disposable, it's it, yeah, like, I don't understand why I'm supposed to care. Like, it's not like the emotional logic of the characters is the important thing, although it is. But they they don't they aren't invested in this system as it works, so this specifically isn't relevant. Still, we've punched God into the sun and saved the world. Time for the credits. See, I wasn't going to start talking because this is about to happen. But then it was longer than I expected. Unbelievable. We Edit. managed to stop this abomination, and it's still going to destroy the world. Jean! Beep, beep. <laughs> Come now. You're one of a kind. If you die here, who's going to save the world? I'll send you home, even if it kills me. Now, let's finish this. You and I are going home together. John, we're both one of a kind. That's gay. Now those are the eyes I've been waiting to see. That's gay. So time for the actual combat of the actual last combat of the game that matters. Uh, you fly around in zero gravity, smashing God's corpse to bits because divine gravel is the way to win the game. Um, save the world through incredible violence. Actually, I like that as a theme of the game, but um, it's actually really hard to control um, the movement here because you're sort of free floating in 3D, but it's quite difficult to figure out where you are and what you're next to. Uh, which means it's just a pain to zoom around and smash things. I think this is the last bit. Yeah, there we go. And time is in fact a closed circle. I do like book ending and references back to the beginning at the end. I can't take these guys seriously because they look like they're wearing their robes over just like jeans and a t-shirt. Can't take Luca seriously either, but that's for a different reason. Okay. This is getting ridiculous. How do you keep surviving all this? Bet you're trying to sneak up on me right now. Aren't you, Bayonetta? Now see, this is what I would call an epilogue. she came from and I guess I'm gonna have to find a new racket to line my pockets no bonus for old Enzo this time <laughs> as fucking usual you know how it works with witches Enzo they make a deal with the devil and when they die the devil gets his due 
you get set down in the hill and wandering around scared shitless for eternity. Kind of comes with the territory. Why are you telling me this? Is this not why we are standing here, praying for her soul to rest in peace? I better not be out here catching a fucking cold if these prayers don't mean nothing. It's nice to think your prayers are worth a damn, isn't it? You made a killing exploiting her. Hell, you never know. She might get lonely and come back to haunt your ass. <coughs> haunt me? Hell can keep her then. Never does anything by half, does he? I said I'd never give up chasing you. I just never thought the chase would end like this. <clears throat> Rosemary. You said it was a demon repellent. Might help you on the road ahead. Second, what the hell are they coming down here to get her for? Of course they'd come for the prize they've been seeking for a while. Holy shit! You're I like that this cutscene gives us a chance to examine some of the details on their costumes that have been harder to notice notice throughout the game. Such as Luca's belt buckle. I need to know what that flower is and if it means anything. The fact that Jean isn't sexualized the way that Bayonetta is, I think redeems Bayonetta's sexualization to some extent. It makes it more something that is to do with her as a person and her personality, rather than being something that is uh, applied externally. Will you hurry up? Don't tell me you fell asleep in that thing again. Hey. What the? You gotta fucking be kidding me! You're telling me she's. Later, we've got work to do. That's gay. I actually really love Bayonetta's personality and character, but um, yeah, there's a lot of nice little details to all of the costumes in this game, even though there are also a lot of confusing ones. Ah, oh, buddy, come on! Can't you see she's happy with her wife? Don't be like that. Oh, Luca, Luca, Luca. But still, just the little accents, the belt buckle, the glasses, the weirdly buckled long gloves. Extra ingenue. It has a bit of rosemary. In the language of flowers, rosemary equates to remembrance. Suits me now, doesn't it? Let's dance, boys! And here we have the actual credits at the actual end of the game. So yeah, uh, just to finish my thought about little details, I noticed that Rodin has a... Um... Oh, don't crash, don't be crashing. Okay, no, it's fine.
I noticed that Rodan has a little uh, halo ring hanging around his neck, but it is coiled around by a serpent, which I think is, you know, it's easy to read meaning into these sorts of things, but I'm sure that must be intentional, representing the fact that while he is of hell, and hell is full of things that used to be angels, um, that he is sort of closer to heaven than um, the other demons. Uh, I don't know if this will be visible in, in the final video, but I'm getting a lot of stutters, which is worrying me a little bit. Um, so, hopefully that'll be fine. So, uh, what was I saying? I was saying, yeah, so... Uh, it's really not fair for technical issues to show up in the final episode of my run. Um, anyway, so, yeah, um, an angel's halo coiled about by a serpent seems like it would be a pretty obvious referent to the fact that, uh, unlike most of his hell compatriots, he's somewhat redeemable. Um, so you could say he's closer to heaven than he was. Not that heaven itself is necessarily a good force in this, as, uh, as I think I commented on a while back, but... He is, uh, it is actually possible to restore him to angelness if you manage to get uh, 10, 000, no, uh, 10 million rings throughout the game. If you get 10 million halos, then you unlock an option you can buy from his shop, which provides you with uh, a bonus boss fight. Why does it keep saying I failed these? Uh, yeah, so these bonus combats in, during the credits, I don't think they count for your score at all. At least I hope they don't. Um, I've, I've never failed them before. I think this must be glitching in some way, so I really hope that this video comes out okay. Anyway, all of that aside. So, um, towards the end of the game, I started to feel like I understood what was happening. Um, in terms of the mechanics of time travel and... Um, all of that sort of stuff. But um, it turns out that what I thought was happening was in no way what actually happened. So my understanding of the narrative logic was that um, Bayonetta gets sealed away um, because she is... <laughs> I love that pose. Um, the secret actual... Oh, hey. And there's... Uh, even Luca in the background, that's fun. So, um... So, my understanding of the logic with regards to the time travel narrative is that um, Bayonetta is sealed away because she is the other eye and, um, you know, if she's taken by the other side, they can reset the universe, which, you know, does kind of destroy everyone in the universe. So that's bad. So in order to prevent that from happening, Bayonetta is sealed away for 500 years. But then they track her, track her down, break her out. Uh, she manages to escape and spends 20 years confused and not understanding what's going on and running around fighting things for no reason while developing this extremely aggressive personality, which I enjoy greatly. Then she meets child version of herself. Child version of herself was brought to the future by uh, Balder, basically because he felt that if he could combine the aggressive modern woman that is Bayonetta with the innocence of her child self, she would fully awaken and become the this powerful entity that he needs to reset the universe. Um, so he brings her to the future, but that child meets Bayonetta, thinks Bayonetta is her own mother, learns from her to be confident and powerful, and then, after the fight with Balder, Bayonetta returns her to the past, thereby closing off a time loop that results in a single set different universe. So Bayonetta, having had the experience as a child of a powerful role model, grows up to become powerful and confident in her own right, confident enough that when she would have been sealed away, she was in fact not sealed away. Uh, my understanding actually grew from thinking that I was seeing the same scene repeatedly with additional information each time we see it, because that ceiling, uh, that scene of the ceiling ritual we see several times, that's a lot of sibilance in that sentence. Um, 
we see several times throughout the game with a little bit more information every time, and I thought she was successively remembering more information about that sequence of events. After the time loop is closed, I thought, ah, okay, so she's actually changed her own history, but it's a stable time loop. So now she remembers the 500 years she would have been sealed away because with the confidence she gained by meeting herself when she was a child, she was then able to stand up to all of the fights she'd need to fight and then just live through that 500 years to the modern day. Which is why she's then strong enough to win in the end. I had a couple of lingering questions and in the process of looking them up... Oh, interesting. So it looks like the uh, those fights in the credits did count, actually. That is unfortunate. Um, oh well. Glitch is gonna glitch, I guess. So, um, yeah, uh, in the process of looking up the answers to my various questions, uh, also this is the scoreboard for the entire game, as you can see, I never got lower than a silver, which I think is reasonably respectable. Even got a couple of perfect platinums. Or maybe that's just ordinary platinum. But yeah, you can go in and see what scores you got and what you did and didn't do and what you might have missed on every individual level that you've played, which is a nice little thing to have, a nice little feature. And I think this scoreboard remains consistent across subsequent New Game Pluses so that you can play, see your scores on hard and stuff later as well. So, um... Right, before I forget my thought that I was thinking, um... Basically, the, uh... The actual truth is that there are now two separate timelines, one in which Bayonetta was sealed and one in which she is not sealed. The rest of the game takes place in the timeline where she was sealed away, but a different timeline has been created and she was able to sort of gain knowledge across the two different timelines. So there's actually two concurrent universes which progress very differently in terms of the plot. This game and its sequel take place in the original timeline. Um, and I think the, that there's supposed to be a game coming out that is set in the other timeline, which is just a bizarre way to handle that instead of the stable time loop, which I assumed was what was happening. So this is just a nice little congratulations on beating the game banner at the end, which I really enjoy. It harkens back to a, a, an older, more glorious age of video games where there was kind of a joyful interaction between, you know, the studio and the player and heaps of bonus content and fun gags and a sort of a... Uh, a joyful engagement with fandom that you don't really see so much nowadays. Um, you know, bonus features containing art books about what stuff was in the game, all of those kinds of things. This kind of harkens back to that. And I suppose this game came out at the tail end of that era, so it makes sense. But as you can see, this is just chock full of little jokes. Bosses getting tickled by demon hands, Bayonetta's parents, the chief witch stirring a cauldron, all of these little gags in the background are just fun to spot thumb war between giant demon hands. Um, anyway, so... Uh, those are also the crappy weapon that you only get at the beginning of the game. So that, I believe, is the end. Except for one final little sequence. Which um, probably should have been when I was talking about the uh, time travel nonsense. I should have saved that for then. Because there's really nothing more to say at this point. But it does, um, it does fit that same kind of era of bonus content. The era of the dance party ending, if you know what I mean. Um, which I think is a term usually reserved for animated movies, but a lot of games in the mid-2000s ended with dance parties, and I, I'm not sure why, but I do appreciate it. So we get this uh, entertainingly animated little sequence taking us back through the various levels of the game, various characters showing up. Also, uh, if you've stuck with me this far, do remember to stay around because uh, next week there is going to be, well, I suppose technically later this week, depending on how timing works out, I will be starting my next Let's Play, which will be Mirror's Edge, one of my favourite games of all time. I have a ton to say about it. Um, unlike Bayonetta, I won't be crystallising my opinions as I play through and uh, developing understanding as I go. I have a lot of stuff to say about that game, which I have been keeping bottled up inside since like 2009. 2010, whenever it came out. Also, it kind of sucks that Rodan won't get involved in the in the dancing. He's just too cool. He's gonna stand there tapping his foot like um like the cool guy. But I think we all know that being unironically into whatever it is you're doing, that's the real cool guy thing. 
Same true. Of, same is true of Luca here, which is a shame because I was honestly hoping he would just crump his way through the background at some point. But yes, yeah, so um, next up will be Mirror's Edge. I hope you'll all stick around for that. I hope you give me subscriptions. I hope you go check me out on Twitter. Follow me there if you want updates about the projects as they uh, develop. But um, this is such a long cutscene. Oh my god. So yeah, um, this has been a wild journey and I hope you enjoyed it with me. I really think these two would be interacting more, but she's just a backup dancer. I think that's a shame. She's like a secondary reflection of Bayonetta rather than an equal participant, which is less than she should, you know. That's kind of um, not giving her her due, in my opinion. One day I'm going to learn to dance like this and then you're all screwed. And there it is, I have finally completed a Let's Play. So, uh, I think that went really well. Uh, catch me later, I've had a fantastic time, I hope you've enjoyed this. And uh, that's all from me. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and there's links to my other projects in the description. Thank you so much for watching.